Well, this morning, it is hard to believe, but we are in the last of the messages in 1 Thessalonians. It's hard to believe that uh, the time has flown past as quickly as it has. If you want to follow along, if you didn't bring a Bible, don't have a Bible, whatever the case may be, these gentlemen would love to put one in your hands. Just slip up your hand and they'll make sure that you receive one. Just a word of encouragement to uh, make it a a point uh, to come and be part of the gathering here on Friday evening and also Saturday morning this week. We're looking forward to uh, Dave Burgraff being with us. Should be just an excellent, excellent time. Uh, Sometimes you hear these speakers and they're just uh, such a blessing uh, and an encouragement and you just take in so many different things that you just never heard before. And so I just wanna encourage you, Dave is that kind of guy and he's doing a lot of work on this and we're looking forward to uh, him being with us uh, here coming up this week. Well, I have about a one-hour message this morning that um, you're never going to beat the Presbyterians to the restaurant, Uh, (laughs) regardless if I try to (laughs) shorten this. Um, So no grand illusions. There there were more people, though. Seriously, there were more people in the first service than usual, and I can see that here because they were looking to get to the restaurant um, without a doubt. So uh, we do offer you that option here at Faith, so you can't really complain. <laughs> First uh, Thessalonians chapter 5, if you would go to First Thessalonians chapter 5 um, with me here, uh, you're going to see a verse of Scripture uh, preceded by a, a couple other verses of Scripture that are all part of one sentence. And it starts here in verse 16 where the Bible says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And this one sentence is broken up into three verses, and as a young person, I was always thankful for that because it was very easy to rejoice evermore and get points in VBS. Um, to say pray without ceasing, you know. I mean, the only thing, that John, John 10, 35 will beat it, Jesus wept, but I had that one down too. Um, and, and you could just parrot those right off like you were some Bible scholar as a, as a youngster. And, uh, and yet, as we look at these, uh, oftentimes when we come to this uh, passage of Scripture, we, we think of the messages maybe that we've heard in the past. Uh, I know growing up in the church, you, you'd hear messages, listen, you need to be rejoicing, um, and, and we don't always rejoice. And there's these catch words, you know, like we need to be praying and we need to be praying what? Without ceasing. And we need to give thanks. But we not only need to give thanks, we need to what? Give thanks for everything. That's right. And and all of these things take us to that next level. And we ask ourselves the question, um, is this going to be one of those messages that I'm going to be rebuked on and and really kind of hammered on because I'm not rejoicing all the time, I'm not praying all the time, and I'm not always thankful And the answer is no, it's not gonna be one of those messages. Let's look to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have blessed us with the word of God. And in addition to telling us, Father, what your will is, you've equipped us to be able to carry out that will in a way that is truly victorious. So help us, Lord, as we we study this passage to be able to extract the truth from it that really impacts us on a a daily level. And so we thank you, Father, for bringing us together this morning. May you be glorified in all things, for it's in Christ's name we pray it, amen. I was out in Colorado on an elk hunt back in the 90s, and I remember um, being asked to go with the outfitter's son uh, to take a camp that was at about 10,000 feet and fold this whole camp up into big, huge sheets uh, called mani packs uh, and place them on the backs of horses that were very uncooperative and bring them on back down the miles down to the bottom of the mountain. And I remember going up there, and if you've ever been with an outfitter, maybe you've uh, taken a canoeing trip, uh, a paddling trip of some sort, or you've been on a fishing trip or a hunting trip, you know that these outfitters basically equip you with everything that you need in order to be successful. This group of uh, hunters were up there, way up in the upper areas, and we went, uh, like I said, and we walked in, and they were gone, and we needed to take everything, the beds out, we needed to take the wood stove. Believe it or not, there's a wood stove in that tent, and we need to fold the wood stove up, and we needed to load it on the back of a horse. We also needed to fold the tent up and put that on a horse. We needed to take the food. We needed to take the coffee maker. We needed to take all those things and put them in those packs 
and take them on back down the mountain. Well, almost everything you need was in those packs, but this is what it would look like if you had horses that were all uh, girded up, and in those packs that are on those horses are basically everything that the outfitter would put in there that you would have a need of. And it may look like something like this. Sometimes they use donkeys instead of horses. They pack them all up really well, and they lead them on up the mountain to where they're trying to get. So you get the idea. And there I was in the 1990s. I was with the outfitter's son, and we had several horses behind us. We would packed up the entire camp, and we were leading all those horses down the mountain in about four feet of snow. It was a wonderful experience. Here's the one sentence that we're going to look at first. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God for you. You know, if the Bible says that this is God's will for me, that God wants this to happen, it makes good sense to understand that God has outfitted us with everything that we need. In other words, in that pack that you saw on that horse, there's everything that you're going to need in order to be able to fulfill his will with regard to our rejoicing, our praying, and our giving thanks. We notice in this one sentence that this is a tall order without a doubt. Think of it this way. God's will for us is that we would rejoice, but not just rejoice. We need to rejoice always, not to just pray, but we're supposed to pray without ceasing. Be thankful. Be thankful for everything. And this only is going to be possible if Jesus is outfitting me for life in this world. Notice with me here as you, you put your finger there on verse 16 and you see those two words, rejoice always. Paul likes to use that term always. He uses it uh, six times in 1 Thessalonians. Um, and these folks here in Thessalonica were enduring persecution. There were certain pressures that had come about that were upon them. And uh, they were no doubt uh, struggling to be able to fulfill uh, this concept of rejoicing. When God's word says that we're supposed to rejoice, we could understand that, but when he says that we're supposed to rejoice always, he's taken it again to another level. And what we're going to need then is more than circumstances that would cause us to rejoice. Without a doubt, there are days that are filled of rejoicing because there are positive circumstances. But there are also times when we don't feel like rejoicing. We don't have joy that's tied to circumstances. When he says to rejoice always, we're transcending the circumstances in our life. And the question that we ask then is how is, how is that possible? How is it possible for me as a follower of Jesus Christ to try to do his will and to try to rejoice on a continual basis? How is that reality for me as a Christian? It's possible because of what God has done for us. It's not a burden like you see here. This is an animal, it's all packed up and you can see that it's kind of a burden. But notice what we see here in John chapter 14. When Jesus Christ sends his disciples into this world, he gives them their marching orders. You're supposed to go out in the Great Commission and the church and all that he is seeking to do. He has not equipped us uh, in a way that leaves us needy. What Jesus has done for us is he's told us that on his departure, the Holy Spirit, the helper, would come. He tells them, the disciples, if you love me, keep my commandments. Well, that's a tall order, isn't it? That's a, that's a big, big thing to do, keeping Jesus' commandments. All you have to do is read through the Gospels and you see the level of teaching that, that Jesus is at. But he says, I will pray that the Father to the Father, and he will give you another helper, sometimes translated comforter, a, a reference then to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would come, he says, and abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, you'll see the S is capitalized, the Holy Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it doesn't see him and it doesn't know him, most importantly. But, he says to his disciples, you do know him, you know the Holy Spirit of God, you can recognize the Holy Spirit of God because you truly know me 
And he says, but you know him, and he dwells with you and will be with you. And so we have in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit coming and indwelling on a permanent basis every single person who's placed their faith in Jesus Christ. So when you go back to 1 Thessalonians 5, and you look at that first verse, and we understand uh, that this joy is a reality, I would spin it this way so that we understand it. I can be joy-filled every day. I'm not just saying to you, you need to be rejoicing always. I'm saying that I can be, you can be joy-filled every day as a Christian. And that is possible because the Holy Spirit has come alongside of us, you see. And that's only possible for us. Whatever the circumstances of our life truly is, I can be joyful every single day. Isn't that great news? I mean, we should, hey, yahoo, right? I mean, that's, that's really amazing. The second thing he says here in this next verse, when he says, pray without ceasing, means that I can pray to him every day leading up to his return. Every single day, I can have communication with God. And this is a comprehensive term. It means to, to cover any reverential communication with God. It's, a, it's an amazing aspect. And when you look at this, it, you see that this aspect is without ceasing. It means, uh, it doesn't mean uninterrupted prayer, but rather it means constant recurring prayer. In other words, we never quit praying to our God. It's ongoing in our life. Now, it's noteworthy that discouragement can lead us to surrender our prayer life. We get discouraged, we can lay it aside. Our prayer then becomes labored and, and, and sometimes it's not there at all. But remember the Holy Spirit in John chapter 14. And go with me to Romans chapter eight. I wanna show you a passage of scripture that relates strongly with what we're talking about here. In Romans chapter eight, picking this up in verse 22, the Apostle Paul writes and he says, we know that the whole creation groans and labors. And it groans and it labors with birth pangs together until now. So he's making the point of saying even creation has been affected by the fall into sin. And he says in verse 23, not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit He's saying, we have that down payment. We have that guarantee. The first fruits in the Old Testament was that initial part of the harvest that was given in a sacrifice to God. And what he's saying here is we have the first fruits of kind of a, an eschatological pledge where the Spirit is the deposit guaranteeing that we are the sons of God and that when that trumpet sounds, we are going to be caught up with Jesus in the clouds. He says that we who have the first fruits of the Holy Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves. So you have the creation groaning because of sin and we groan ourselves. We're eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Wow. He says we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope for why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. You see, I have the first fruits, you have the first fruits of the Holy Spirit residing in you, and that is sealing you unto the day of redemption, and you are looking forward, hopefully, to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're looking forward to that. Uh, that, that's something you're excited about. And what Paul says is, I'm in this body and I'm groaning because this body is mortal. This body is subject to pain and difficulty. But this body is also sin riddled, isn't it? It has a sin nature. And because it has a sin nature, it's dragging me down and I find myself groaning under the weight of it but it's not always going to affect me in this way because there's coming a day when I'm gonna be set free from it and be given a new body that won't know any of those difficulties or weaknesses. He says in verse 26, likewise the Spirit also helps us in our weakness. So again, you see the role of the Holy Spirit 
He says, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And the idea here is not that the Spirit of God is groaning, but if you looked at the original, you'd see that it was the person praying or trying to pray who can't even get the words out that the Spirit of God takes that that groaning in their spirit and it's a prayer request that's brought then by the Holy Spirit to God the Father, isn't that awesome? So even though I'm in this time of weakness, even though I'm not strong, even though I'm having a really tough time, God says, I've equipped you in that pack that's on the back of that horse, if you were to open it up, you would find the Holy Spirit is able to bring about the reality of my praying without ceasing, without interruption, in the sense that I can constantly come to God. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, it's phenomenal when you stop and you think about what God has equipped us to do, because I know that every day doesn't go as I planned it. Does it for you? Does every day go as well as you planned? I mean, do you have one of those stickers, life is great, on the back of your car, you know? I mean, just woohoo, I'm just gonna wanna live for here forever. I mean, it's just not the reality for most people, is it? And God says, you know what, you can rejoice. I'll give you my joy and you'll have it every day. You will be able to constantly come to me in prayer because even when you can't physically pray it, he says, the Holy Spirit of God, I've brought to you and he will enable you. How fantastic it truly is to see God provide. Notice the third point there in 1 Thessalonians chapter five and verse 18. He says here that I can live with a spirit of thanksgiving. See, I haven't said, you know, you need to be thankful all the time. I can live with a spirit of thanksgiving. Isn't that great news? I mean, isn't it great news that you can be filled with joy? Isn't it great news that you can pray all the time? Isn't it great news that you can be thankful for everything? Well, you say, I give thanks, but do I have to really give thanks for everything? How is that even possible? You see, this admonition really takes it to another level, and it's obviously above circumstances. That is one thing we know for sure. Part of what the Holy Spirit of God does is he, he, he works so that we can have the right attitude when it comes to this life and understand things with the proper perspective. Oftentimes, we struggle as human beings because we don't have the right perspective. For instance, here's a verse of scripture that's pretty well known. And it's right in that passage that we just came from in Romans chapter eight. So if you stop and you consider you know, the creation groaning and our groaning, all of these things going on, look at verse 828 in the context that we just came from. And unfortunately this morning we just don't have the time to, to, to pull it all apart. But notice what that verse says, he says, And we know, we know by fact, and Paul is able to say we know by experience that all things work together for what? For good. God's overall plan is good. And we have knowledge of that and we understand that. It's it's wonderful to know. Now, he puts that caveat in there because he says it works together for good to those what? Who are loving God. To those who are called according to his purpose. You see, God has a plan for his church, and God's working it all out together for good. Even the the difficult moments, God says, I have a plan in this, and you have something that's wonderful to look forward to that the world doesn't know anything about. You as a Christian have the Holy Spirit of God working in your life, and I have this plan, God is saying, and because I know what God's plan is, I can be thankful for everything, knowing that I'm on my way to verse 23, which is speaking there about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Is that good news? That is fantastic news. I mean, this gets us excited because when we look at this, we see this is the will of God for us. He doesn't want his children to be walking through this life unthankful, depressed, discouraged, not able to pray. That's not what God's will for you is. And what God has done is he's made it possible. He's put all the tools in that pack, you see. And all we need to do is take them and apply them. And he says we can live this victorious way. 
It's not to say that we're not going to have pressures and difficulties. It's not to say that Romans chapter eight is incorrect and we won't groan in our spirit because of the difficulties of our flesh. But what he says is, I've given you what you need. You're well outfitted to be able to incorporate these three things into your life. God is able to provide for us even when the circumstances are at their worst. But here's the funny thing. Even though God has done all of this for us, we can be our absolutely worst enemy. Do you know that? I mean, God does all of this for us, and we can mess it up. I'm gonna be totally honest with you. We are good at messing things up, aren't we? God lays out this perfect plan, and it's amazing to me how many Christians don't wanna even follow God's plan. Some things can go sideways when the intentions are the best. Uh, there were three sons that were, um, they were very prosperous sons and they, they, they left home and they, they made it well. They got together one year and they discussed the Mother's Day gifts that they're going to give to their, their elderly mom. And the first one said, I'm going to give her a beautiful home. I have built her this huge, huge home. And the second one said, wow, that's amazing. All I did was get her a Mercedes Benz and a driver. Well, the third said, I've got you both beat. He says, you know how mom enjoys the Bible and you know how she can't see it very well? Well, I sent her a brown parrot that can recite the entire Bible. <laughs> it took 20 monks in a monastery, 12 years to teach this bird. He said, I had to pledge to contribute $100,000 a year for 20 years, but it was worth it. Mom just has to name the chapter and the verse, and the parrot will recite it. What a gift. Soon thereafter, Mom sent out her letters of thanks. And she wrote to the first son, Milton, she said, the house you built is too big. I live in only one room, but I have to clean the entire house. She wrote to the second son. She said, Marvin, I'm too old to travel. I stay home all the time, so I've never even used the Mercedes, and the driver is so rude. She wrote to the third son, Dearest Melvin, you are the only son to have the good sense to know what your mother likes. The chicken was delicious. <laughs> That's a meal she won't forget. <laughs> well, while God has equipped us to be successful, we often think or we feel that we can be successful without him. And I want to show you here four areas in the minutes that we have left that really impact this perfect plan that God has laid out. Notice there in verse 19, I don't believe that this verse is a verse that is segmented away from the context here. I believe that it's very relative to everything that we're talking about. Paul writes here and he says, do not quench the spirit. Literally, this means to stop extinguishing the work of the Holy Spirit. I love it in the original language, it's a, a, a negative that precedes this present imperative. And what that means is, if you were to translate it literally, you would say, stop quenching or stop extinguishing the Holy Spirit. It was something that was evidently going on. And some might think that in Thessalonica that this was a problem, that they were quenching the Holy Spirit. But the more I read that and the more I try to understand it for myself, I believe that this could be spoken to me in verse 19 on any given day and I would feel the weight of that rebuke. In other words, when the Holy Spirit of God is beginning to work in my life, when he stirs my heart, I may seek to stifle it. You see, it's so easy for us to take the working of the Holy Spirit of God and, and set it aside. You see, you and I need to have the Spirit of God working in our life in order to be able to move us past the circumstances of our life so that we're able to, to rejoice on a continual basis. Without the Holy Spirit of God, I can't pray in a way that is constant. I can't 
be thankful for all things. You see, they are absolutely tied together. And what I need and what you need as a follower of Jesus Christ is to be controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. You realize that we're either controlled by the Holy Spirit of God or we're controlled by our our flesh. That's right. What disturbs me the most about that passage, by the way, is the fact that there's no middle ground. I hate that. Because I somehow would like to be able to say, well, yeah, I'm not exactly controlled by the Holy Spirit, but, you know, I'm doing okay. Are you, anybody else feeling that? And, and yet the Bible is very, very clear. It's like, uh, no, you're controlled by the flesh if you're not controlled by the Spirit, Cap. And the Holy Spirit of God is continually working in our hearts as Christians. And if we would follow the Holy Spirit of God and his working in our life, that rejoicing and praying and thankfulness, among many other things, would be present there on a regular basis. The problem is we like to extinguish the working of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit convicts us. He, the Holy Spirit does a lot of different things. He convicts us of our sin. That's probably one of the most obvious things. But he also gifts us in spiritual ways. Spiritual gifts are, are part of what he does. He illuminates or lights up the scripture for us so that we can understand it. He gives us assurance of salvation. We're sealed unto the day of redemption. That's, that's part of the working of the Holy Spirit. Um, he helps us when we're burdened, as I mentioned um, in Romans chapter eight. But the Holy Spirit of God is operative in the life of every believer. And it's so easy for us to snuff out that working and push it aside. And that's why God's word says, you need to stop doing that. You need to stop that ongoing activity of pushing the Holy Spirit out of your life. Do you have any idea what we would look like as Christians if we stopped doing that? I mean, that's the whole reason we don't grow as much. That's the whole reason we're not obedient as we should be. It's the whole reason that we, we struggle. It's, it's not that God hasn't equipped me. It's that I, I want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I, I, you know, Holy Spirit, oh, I don't want to talk about the Holy Spirit. Let's, let's not talk about the Holy Spirit. You know, that gets a little dicey. And yet God has given to us his spirit and we desperately need his control on We won't come to that goal apart from the Holy Spirit of God. Notice he says here that on the second point, he says stop dismissing prophetic teachings. Do not despise prophecies. It was easy for the early church when they were listening to these who would come having this gift of of prophesying. Notice here, he says in Ephesians chapter four, and he gave himself some to be apostles. What's the second one? It's prophets. It's, it's a very honorable scenario. You, you see, the word of God would come in those things that had been inspired and written, whether the author was, was Paul or Peter or whoever, uh, but this canon of scripture was not sealed until after John writes Revelation, and then we have everything that we need. And leading up until that time, the church would have people that were gifted spiritually to come and to give a word of assurance or guidance. That's what this is speaking of here. That's what those prophets would do. Don't confuse prophecy with uh, 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 to prophesy. Prophecy is the the forward, future, eschatology, etc. But the person who would come with this gift would come not to tell what the future was, but to give more instruction. And the tendency was, uh, again, stop dismissing prophetic teachings. This is something that was easy for them to do. If I didn't like what this prophet was saying, I could just dismiss it kind of like tearing pages out of your Bible. But you see, they needed the Spirit of God. They needed the Word of God. And this word was a strong word. It means to treat with contempt. And that's what was going on in the church. You know, it's, it's similar today, even though we have the completed Word of God, it's easy for churches, it's easy for places to treat with contempt certain passages they don't agree with. We have to be careful to understand this is God's word. He has outfitted the church with his word. 
which can bring us to that point of maturity. You notice 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 tells us all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness so that the man of God may be complete or perfect, thoroughly equipped for every good work. You see, the word of God today it contains everything that we need. And so the church needed to stop dismissing prophetic teachings. They also needed to avoid false teachings. He would go on and he would say here, uh, test all things, verse 21. Hold fast that which is good. Uh, the word hold fast is, a, is a, great, uh, a great term. And it means to habitually cling to that which is good teaching. Notice that last word, that verse in 22, he says abstain from every form of evil, that external form. Uh, In the Greek, uh, sometimes that word form could be used um, as a word for kind. In other words, abstain from all kinds of evil. But you get the idea that we as believers are supposed to, to hold fast to that which is good and that which is right, and we're to push away or abstain from every form of wickedness. It's the, the idea of, of picking something up. Have you ever picked something up that absolutely stunk? You ever done that? I mean, something that really reeked, like something like, I don't know. I don't want to be gross. <laughs> I've done it. You pick it up, you hold your nose, and you put it away as far as you can until you get to the trash or wherever you're going to throw it, right? Have you ever been there? Been there with me? Okay, yep. This is the idea. You want to abstain. You want to keep that wickedness as far away from you as you possibly can while holding tight to that which is that good teaching. And Paul uses a verbal uh, way to do this. It's a corresponding technique in the original that allows him to show forth two different sides, holding fast to that good teaching and taking that wickedness and putting it far away. And he does it all because we ultimately are looking at coming down the chute and that final countdown there in verse 23. I read that for you now. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you, literally to make you holy and make you holy completely. That word there, completely, is the only time that word is used in the New Testament, and it's three different Greek words all combined. It means to wholly attain to the end, reach the intended goal. There is not one part that's not reached. And what God's word is saying is that you will be sanctified, you will be made holy, and every single part of you will be made holy. And he goes on to say, this includes your soul, your spirit, and your body. All three of those things. The dichotomous view versus the trichotomous. And obviously Paul here is that trichotomous because he's talking here about the body. That body that groans, that sin nature, all of that is going to be done away. I'm going to be completely sanctified. And not only am I going to be completely sanctified in my body, but also in my spirit and in my soul. The spirit is which we have that brings life to us and our soul is that which will live for eternity. He is saying every single part of you, every molecule, every cell in your body is going to be sanctified. It's going to be made holy. And it is going to be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Whew. That means that when Jesus Christ comes for his church, I'm gonna be ready. It means that he is going to sanctify me completely. And I am going to be part of the body of Christ that is presented to him blameless without corruption. Is that fantastic? I just look forward to that day. I think it will be an amazing day. Might be the best day of my life. I'm excited about it. And what God says is, listen, Kevin, I've equipped you to live life victoriously despite life's circumstances now. I've given to you this great Outfitters uh, deluxe pack, and I've equipped you. God has said, I knew you needed the Holy Spirit, Kevin, because I knew you couldn't do it by yourself. Amen. We need the Holy Spirit. And you just mess it up. You, 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 so make sure you don't quench the Holy Spirit of God. Because you are coming down the the chute here. You're coming towards the coming of the Lord and you want to be ready. You want faith in Christ. Number one, 
Is Jesus Christ your Savior? Has he forgiven you your sin? He asks you to do one thing, and that is to call upon his name, placing your faith and trust in him, understanding that it was Jesus Christ who took your sin upon himself and paid the penalty of your sin, which, by the way, was death. He died. He rose again to show forth that he had conquered death. Death is not victorious. It's not where it ends. And because it's not victorious, you can now have life, and it is that life that Jesus Christ gives to every single one of his followers, those who have put their faith in him. If you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, then you don't have that eternal life yet. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You see, it's all about that everlasting life. And so you, if you're here this morning and you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you want to do that. It's the most important decision you could ever make because on the other side of life is eternal death. And if you've made that decision to trust him, it is absolutely vital that you understand that he has given to you everything that you need to live a life that is according to his will. And the way to mess it up is to quench the spirit of God. Are you allowing the spirit of God to work in your life? If you looked at yourself in the mirror, which way would it go? Are you being controlled by the spirit of God or are you being controlled by your flesh? There's no middle ground. It is either one or the other. I am thrilled that God is a God who sees everything that I need before I do, and he makes it all possible to do the things that he said in his word. Are you enjoying that? Are you thriving in that? This is his desire for us. And we look forward to verse 23, but until that time, we want to experience rejoicing and praying and giving thanks as he has given us the power to do that. Let's pray. Perhaps you're here this morning and, and God's been at work at your heart. He's working in your life today. You may be here this morning and you would say, Part of your struggle is the extinguishing of the Holy Spirit's work in your life. Maybe there's been times recently where you've been convicted and, and you've pushed it away. I think that would apply to most of us every single day to one degree or another. Maybe you're here this morning and say, Pastor Kevin, as we close in prayer, lift me up in prayer I want my life to reflect the will of God. I want to be what he wants me to be. I'm ready to meet the Lord Jesus Christ if he comes today, which would be awesome. Probably one of my biggest motivations of staying here longer is to try to grow in my faith allow the process of sanctification to go far deeper than it has already. So when his return occurs, I feel like I'm a little bit more ready, if you know what I mean. Oh, I'm ready. Jesus Christ has made that clear. But what will he find when he returns in my heart, in your heart? a work that's incomplete or a work that's mature, like Second Timothy talks about. I wonder if you're here this morning, you say, Pastor Kevin, pray for me. God is working in my heart and life. Some of these things, I'd love to pray for you this morning. Would you just slip up your hand and say, hey, Pastor, I'm like you, pray for me. Absolutely, happy to pray for you. Amen. Maybe you're here this morning and there's questions floating around in your mind about placing your faith in Jesus Christ. 
at the caring concern teams here at the front of the service, um, or after the service, front of the church. They'd love to talk with you further, pray with you, if you've got some questions on your heart today. Would you join me in standing and we'll have a word of prayer today. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for the equipping work of the Spirit of God. We thank you, Father, that as we look towards that, count, that final countdown, that Lord, you have uh, prepared us uniquely to be uh, successful. You've given to us, Lord, uh, reason for optimism and excitement. Lord, work in our hearts because we know how easy it is for us to extinguish the working of the Spirit of God. Work in these who've asked for prayer this morning, Lord, you know what the situations and needs might be and we pray, Father, that you would just finish the work that you've begun. Lord, if there's someone here today who's not certain of where they'll spend their eternity, Lord, may they truly investigate to find what it means to, to know Christ, to have their sins forgiven and to have assurance that they will spend eternity with, with you in heaven, Lord. And may you truly be glorified. Help us, Lord, to live this week, Lord, in a way that's pleasing to you. Help us, Father, to reflect our Savior. And Lord, when we fail, help us, Father, to get back on our feet again and, and stay at it. Help us, Lord, not to become discouraged, but Lord, help us to avail ourselves of the work of the Spirit of God. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.